Well, in mentioning the Super Bowl last last time, I was thinking I wanted to mention something else. I forgot to remember. Now, you, if, if any of you do like watching the Super Bowl, you're really in a nice time, a nice period of Super Bowl history. In the 2000s and 2010s, most of the Super Bowls have been very close, very competitive, pretty good games. When I was your age, 1980s, 1990s, early 1990s, pretty much all the Super Bowl games were blowouts. You're like, oh, another Super Bowl, another blowout. So we can be thankful that we've been having pretty good Super Bowls here recently. I'm really excited today because I have some technology to help me. Went to the library just five minutes ago and got a clicker, and they said I could even borrow it for the whole semester to go through the PowerPoints here. And uh, we're going to have some, <coughs> we got some high technology here with PowerPoint Mathematica, but we're going to also use some low technology here with an overhead projector today. You might guess we're going to talk about dihedral groups a little bit with the symmetries of equilateral triangles and maybe squares if we get to it. So I'm pretty excited about that. All right. Um, so lecture A, we'll look at uh, the definition, the formal definition of a group. Uh, talk about something called Cayley tables, which you read about. Maybe do a proof related to the or two related to the definition of a group. If we have time, arithmetic examples and start talking about di dihedral groups, that may carry over into lecture 4B, where we talk a little bit more about equivalence relations, number theory, and proofs. We'll see how we are as far as time goes. All right, so let's be a little bit more formal now. What properties do we require of a group? You think you can name them based on what I've, I've been sort of doing this kind of thing before? Closure. Closure. Again, the text states that there is a binary operation. This is assumed in our textbook, not necessarily in other textbooks, that it means it satisfies closure. But that does need to be checked for individual examples. The book mentions a really good example to think about. If you think about the irrational numbers, which include things like square root of 2, square root of 3, pi, e, that kind of thing, under multiplication, and you also include, say, the number 1, so you make sure you have an identity in it, Under multiplication, the irrationals are not closed. For example, square root of 2 times itself is 2, which is not irrational. Okay? It's also not 1. So uh, you do need to check it for some specific examples. Um, but again, as far as the definition goes, the book says it's a binary operation. That is going to automatically mean it's closed. What's the next property? The associative property. Associative property, yep. By the way, the binary operation, technically speaking, is a function from the Cartesian product of the group with itself to the group itself that takes, say, an ordered pair, A comma B, and maps it to A times B, say. You could put the dot in there a dot b for times, but it's traditional to not to bother, like usual in math, just write a times a b, meaning a times b. So that's what the binary operation does, and it's guaranteed then to be an element of g. We don't usually bother writing the ordered pair, right? We just write the product. But that's really what's technically going on in the background. Associativity means It doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. A, B times C, meaning do A times B first, and then times C equals this, where you do B times C first, and then left multiply by A. So that's associativity. What's the next property? I should add this is, say that again? Identity. Yeah, the existence of an identity. Existence <laughs> of an identity. In the element, there exists uh, a special element of G called the identity, E, standing, uh, I think they say it's a German abbreviation for something of the word Einheit, basically means identity in German. There exists an E in G such that what? A times E equals E times A equals A. How uh, should I finish it for? Here? 
I should add something else. For all A. For all A and G. We use E in the abstract theory. Some people use the simple one because the identity under multiplication is often one or maybe an identity matrix that people often use the symbol one for as well, or a capital I, say. But when we're doing the theory in here, we use the letter E. And existence of what? Finish it for me. Inverse. Of inverses, yeah. Existence of inverses. For all A and G, there exists an element we will traditionally call it A inverse and write it like that. I'll go ahead and write it like that right from the start. Such that when you multiply it on either side of A, you get back the identity. A, A inverse equals A inverse A equals E. Anything else? Back to the screen here. Anything else? Commutativity? Well, no, technically not. Commutativity is not required. Why not? Because there's lots of examples that are not commutative. Matrix multiplication examples where your elements are matrices, square matrices, and the group operation is multiplication. Those matrices have to have non-zero determinant as well to be in the general linear group. Function composition, we saw that example where the elements of the group are functions and the operation was function composition. Function, com function composition in general is not commutative. Those kinds of examples are important kinds of examples that we want to be groups. And if we want them to be groups, then we better not require commutativity. However, some groups are commutative, like in modular arithmetic. Zn, under addition, is commutative. Un, we talked about that before, I'll talk about it more today, under multiplication. The group of units, modulo n, is also commutative. Abelian is what it's called more officially. When it is satisfied, when commutativity is satisfied, the group is called an abelian group. Don't say abelian, say abelian after Abel. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? It's nice when groups are commutative. They have more properties when they are. That can be deduced. But some groups are not. Let's prove a few, few things here. <coughs> Based on this. So this is pretty broad, so you might wonder <coughs> what you can prove based on this definition. You might think it's not much, but there's actually quite a bit you can prove. Basically, the entire first month and a half to two months of this course, we're doing group theory, we are trying to deduce logical consequences of this definition. So it leads to a lot of structure that you might not imagine. Probably the main thing will be, how does the structure of the group depend on the number of elements in the group? And that's especially interesting for us when we have finite groups. Well, what's an example of a basic kind of theorem that you can derive from this? So I'll call it a proposition. I'll write it in words. The identity element of any group is unique. There's only one identity. It's not part of the definition. We don't say there exists unique E. Don't put an exclamation point there. We, we could have, because this proposition over there is true, but I don't need to assume it, because I can prove it. If you can prove something, then you don't need to assume it. Proof, let G be a group. Again, there's, a, there's an assumed operation, and I won't emphasize that. 
let E and E prime say be identities. In G. By the way, prime here is not really anything related to calculus, no derivatives here. We actually will talk a little bit about derivatives later in the course. More as a formal thing, not in terms of limits. More as just a formal manipulation you can do. So suppose you got more than one identity, essentially. If you can show that these two things must be the same, then you'd be done. That would mean the identity is unique. So what do you do? We must need to use the fact that they're identities. That's a real key thing to realize. If you are going to prove this, you're going to need to use that fact, the fact that you are assuming they are identities, just like in induction proofs. When you do an induction proof, you all always need to use the inductive hypothesis in some way. Otherwise, you're not really doing an induction proof. So we've got to use that fact. How? Well, you could go back to the definition and start thinking about other elements A, for which this equation here would be true for both E and E prime. And you know that you could think about that for a few minutes, but it doesn't really get you anywhere until you realize that the A could also be E or E prime. And that's the key. That equation is true if A is also replaced by E. I'm just going to write two equalities here and be done, essentially. Then E equals E times E prime. Why? Since what should I say? Since E is an identity or E prime is an identity? E prime. Since E prime is an identity. Yeah. E is like the A now. But now I can turn around and treat the E prime like the A and use the fact that E is the identity, an identity, and say this equals E prime. Done. I should add a little bit more. Where the first equality the first equality is because E prime is an identity of G and the second is because E is an identity. Okay? And you should add those kinds of reasons for a proof like this. So since you've shown E equals E prime for these conceivably different identities at first, then the identity must be unique. It's a little tricky, but when it comes down to it, it's pretty simple. All right, let's prove another proposition. By the way, again, I re remind you that in tests you are going to have to write down definitions and theorems. Oftentimes these definitions and theorems have names or at least can be described. The preceding proposition was that the identity of the group is unique. So if I say on the test, write down the theorem, <laughs> That would be it. That, that, that's probably too easy. I probably wouldn't put that on the test. Write down the theorem that says the identity of a group is unique. Okay, well, that basically is a, you basically stated it. I stated it for you there. Well, this one's got another name. It's called the cancellation law. Let G be a group. And suppose you've got three elements here in the group, A, B, and C. A comma B comma C, these are all elements of G with the property that A, B equals A, C. What do you think you can conclude from that? Take a guess. 
Yeah, then b equals c. <coughs> it's like you can cancel the a's. We're not assuming some commutative activity, so m really it might be better to call this a left cancellation law. There is a corresponding right cancellation law as well. If b a equals c a, then b equals c as well. It's not an axiom, it's not something we're assuming the definition, so we need to prove it, <coughs> if it is indeed true. And I can pretty much say the same kind of thing that I started with here. Let me just do this. The first sentence can be essentially recopied there in the proposition statement, let G be a group and suppose you've got three elements with that being true. Any ideas about how to finish this proof? This is probably, at this point, it's probably most similar to <coughs> matrix, abstract matrix algebra and linear algebra, rather than vector spaces. You could pretend these things are matrices. These are inverse of A. Yeah, A has an inverse, and what should I do with it? Put it on the far left. Yeah, so multiply of, both. Of, of each side. Of yeah, page. multiply both sides by A inverse. Technically, maybe I should prove something else ahead of time. If I multiply both sides of an equation <coughs> on, let's say, the left by the same thing, I do get new equal things. I won't bother doing that for today. Maybe we'll come back to it next time. Left multiply, and it is good to emphasize left multiply. You could also say multiply and left both sides by A inverse, to get A inverse e, uh, times in parentheses AB equals A inverse times in parentheses uh, AC. Again, I am, I am really doing that using something that technically should be proved. But if you've got two equal things and you multiply both of those things by the same element, say on the left, that the new things are also equal, that's technically something that should be proved. I, our author doesn't do it. And now you might think, okay, I should cancel the A and the A inverse, and that is true, but you really should show one more step first. You should use associativity. By the associative property, this means we can rearrange the parentheses. A inverse A in parentheses times B equals A inverse A in parentheses times C. So EB equals EC, and therefore B equals C by the definition of what the identity is. Since E is, and now I can say the identity, or the identity if you prefer. Sometimes I say the and sometimes I say the. It's only in proofs that are in chapter two that you're going to need to, need to mention the associative property. Usually you're, I'm going to let you use it without mentioning it. And again, I could do a similar right cancellation law to prove that too. So you can always assume for future reference that the cancellation law works. But if the group is not commutative, and again in the general theory it's not assumed to be commutative, if you've got an equation like this, AB equals CA, you cannot necessarily cancel the A's. B does not necessarily equal C. 
if the group is commutative, abelian, then that would be true. Because you could change the order here. You could say that equals a c and then cancel the a's. Should you ever show this kind of notation? a, b equals a, c, slash, slash, cancel the a's? It's probably not best, but I might be forgiving. Better to think in terms of multiplying the left by the inverse. That'll help you for certain, certain problems anyway if you focus on thinking about it that way anyway. Here's something new that you've read about, a sometimes helpful tool called a Cayley table. It's a generalization of a multiplication table from elementary school. Let's do something. Let's make a Cayley table for Z3. I mentioned this last time, but I'll mention it again. Whenever you see a symbol like this, a standard group Z3, Zn, it is assumed that the group operation here is addition modulo n, in this case addition modulo 3. That is assumed from now on when you use the symbol. Where we talk about just one operation. Actually, later, once we get into chapter, I think it's 13, a month and a half or so from now, two months maybe. Um, we're going to start talking about ring theory, and then we will include also a, a second operation, of multiplication, mod n. Z3, though, is actually, well, Z3, Z4, for example, is not a group under multiplication mod n. Z3 happens to be. So in general, Zn is not necessarily a group under <coughs> multiplication mod n. Because they're in the being things called zero divisors that come into play. I won't say what that is right now. So Z3 has three elements. 0, 1, and 2. Operation is addition modulo 3. Make a table just like a multiplication table from elementary school. Something like this. And you put the products, or in this case, the sum of these things in these different squares. You might want to emphasize the operation is plus mod 3 here in the upper left, or maybe just plus sub 3 for short, though that's not typically done. So you're just adding. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 2 is 2, same thing here and here. So far we haven't had to mod. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 here, okay, now you have to mod, is 0. Mod 3. 2 plus 1 is also 0 mod 3, and 2 plus 2 is 1 mod 3. Plus 2 is 4. Divide 4 by 3, you get the remainder of 1. And there you have it. There's the Cayley table. Something interesting to note, and is worth noting, <clears throat> in each column and in each row of the main body of the table right there, each group element occurs exactly once. Right? <coughs> in any column, looking at what circle here, in any column and in any row, each group element occurs exactly once, and that will happen for the Cayley table of any finite group. You may take Cayley tables for infinite groups, I guess you sort of can, and I guess it would happen in that case too. At least in certain circumstances, you really, you really can't make Cayley tables for, for example, the group of real numbers under addition. But the group of integers under addition, I suppose you probably could make some sort of Cayley table for it, but it would have to be interpreted or drawn carefully. How about Z4? Now it's addition mod 4. Add 
add one more element. See how quickly you can do it if you're doing it with me? It's addition mod 4, so 1 plus 2 is no longer 0, it is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4, which is 0, mod 4. There you have it. So again, in this main body, each element in any column, in any row, each element occurs exactly once. You should also note that you can quickly read off the inverse of an element. For example, the inverse of 1 would be the thing you add to it to get 0, which is the identity, 3. The inverse of 1 is 3. You probably should not write it using multiplicative notation here. This is an additive group. It's better to write the inverse of 1 as negative 1. And negative 1 equals 3. That's what this is saying. The inverse, the additive inverse of 1 is 3. <coughs> mod 4. And that equation makes sense in both the division algorithm sense and equivalence or congruence modulo 4 as well. If you divide negative 1 by 4, what do you get? This is a little tricky. The quotient is actually Um, negative 1, and the remainder, which can't be negative, is taken to be 3. So under th thinking about the division algorithm, the remainder is 3 when you divide negative 1 by 4, and therefore that's a reason for this equality. If you're thinking in terms of congruence, mod 4, put the 3 lines there, it still works there as well because negative 1 minus 3 is a multiple of 4. It's negative 1 times 4. So you can think of it either way. Either in terms of the original definition of mod, in terms of the division algorithm and the remainder, or in terms of congruence mod 4. Take the difference of these two things. Is it a multiple of that thing? And it is. One more interesting observation in the second example here, Z4, is the set of group elements, just 0 and 2, form a group unto themselves under addition mod 4, meaning if you just consider those two elements and only focus on the parts of the Cayley table that only involve 0 and 2, this part, this part, this part, and this part, it's closed under addition mod 4. 2 plus 2 is 0. 2 plus 0 is 2. 0 plus 0 is 0. Mod 4. <coughs> That's interesting. That's something special. It's called, that means that that set is what's called a subgroup of the original group. This is. subgroup of Z4 under addition mod 4. Remember linear algebra? Subspaces of vector spaces. It's a similar concept. A subspace of a vector space is a subset that's closed under the same operation, vector addition. Similar kind of thing happens with groups. You can have subgroups. That's something you're going to be reading about for Friday. How are you doing? Staying awake? <laughs> UN and DN. Real important groups. <laughs> ZN, UN, DN where n is a finite positive integer, are all really important examples of finite groups. 
Remember, un is called the group of units modulo n. It's the set of all as a set, the set of all positive integers less than n that are relatively prime to n. Under multiplication mod n, not addition. We'll make a Cayley table for a couple of examples of this one too. It's called the group of units modulo n. Again, this warning, the un can also stand for a different group called the unitary group, whose elements are matrices and whose product is matrix multiplication. We will, I'm not sure if we'll talk about the unitary group at all. Maybe if we have time someday I'll talk about it. A unitary matrix generalizes the idea of an orthogonal matrix to a situation with complex number entries. In linear algebra, you should have talked about orth orthogonal matrices. Matrices whose inverse was actually their transpose. Very special matrices. If you allow complex number entries, you can generalize that idea. All right, let's make uh, Cayley tables for U8 and U10. As a set, U8 is all positive integers less than 8 that are relatively prime to 8. So they better be odd, pro odd positive integers, including 1. 1, 3, 5, and 7. I'm making the Cayley table. Double lines along the edges here. The operation now, though, is multiplication mod 8. <clears throat> 1 is the identity. 1 times anything is itself. So you can quickly fill in those elements. And maybe you want to race me. That might make help you stay awake. See if you can fill this in as fast as you can. See if you can beat me. Ready? Go. And you can use the fact that each group element occurs only once in each row and each column. To help you fill in, for example, these three elements, I did those last, without even bothering to do a multiplication. Just understand what I mean? So I was, in my head, I was doing the multiplications to fill in these entries. Hopefully I did not make a mistake. Look good to people. And then, since I knew each group element only occurs once in each column, for example, I knew since in this column there was a 3, 1, and 7, I knew that that one had to be a 5. This one's 5, 7, 1, I knew that had to be a 3. This one had to be a 1. Kind of like Sudoku or something, right? What can we observe about this? An interesting thing that's occurring here that did not occur in the previous examples is the identity is occurring along this main diagonal. And if you've got the group elements in order in both over here and up there, that's emphasizing that each element is its own inverse. And here you use multiplicative notation. One inverse is one, and in fact, in general, E inverse is always E. The inverse of 3 is itself, the inverse of 5 is itself, and the inverse of 7 is itself. Again, I'm using powers now, multiplicative notation, because the operation is multiplication. You can also see the abelian nature of the group. Again, if you've got the elements in the same order on the side and the top there, this inner matrix is like it's a, it's a, a <coughs> symmetric matrix. Look along the main diagonal, look for symmetry. 7, 7, 5, 5, 5, 5, 3, 3. 
is a symmetric matrix. It's transposed would equal itself. All right, let's do U10 now. 10 is 2 times 5, so I do not want any even elements. I also don't want 5 in here. 1, 3, 7, 9. On your multiplication mod 10. Nine. Go ahead and start filling it in. Multiplication mod 10. See how fast you can do it. Make sure you're careful to think about what group you're thinking about. Now, I don't know why I was doing the multiplications wrong in my head or something, too. That looks better. It's easy to lose track of what you're modding by or something. <coughs> why I put a 5 there? Oh, I know why. As I started filling in this one, I did 3 times 3 is 9. Then I did 3 times 7 is 21, which is 1 mod 10. Then I was thinking about the preceding example. I didn't bother doing the multiplication three times nine. I was thinking, oh, okay, I was thinking of the U8 example and saying, oh, we're missing a five, so I just put a five. <coughs> that was my mistake. This one's also a symmetric matrix, emphasizing the fact that the group is abelian. However, we do not have ones on the diagonal all the way, only here and here. We do not have ones there and there. 3 and 7 are not their own inverses, but 1 and 9 are. Three inverse, the inverse of 3 is 7, and vice versa, the inverse of 7 is 3. By the way, it is also true, it can be proved that the inverse of A inverse is A, just like with matrices. Being illustrated here with three and seven, really. Again, so it'd be a way through. So it's different than the and then U8, isn't it? Not just with what the elements are, but also in the nature of what's an inverse of what. With U8, every element was its own inverse. And with U10, that's not true. So in some real fundamental sense, ignoring the superficial difference in the numbers themselves and the operation them, operations themselves, these groups U8 and U10 truly are different. They are two different groups, non-isomorphic groups, with four elements. That's an interesting and useful observation if, you're, if your goal is to study the structure of, for example, finite groups to realize there's at least two distinct non-isomorphic groups of order four. Could there be three or four? We don't know yet. OK, I guess it's quiz time. Let's go ahead and take the quiz. Dr. Kimmel, is nine inverse one or? Oh, uh, it's nine. nine. Mistake. <laughs> 